I think um, uh, you, you've touched on a very good point. Uh, we, one step in this road to recovery is opening the borders. And, and it's a combination of desire, as we heard earlier, and ability. What, I, what we've actually seen is, so a little bit of ability has now ach been achieved with the borders opening. To answer the question on desire, we've actually seen quite a lot of desire. Um, there was um, mention earlier about the, um, the, the isolation, the natural isolation of the Maldives. Um, this idea of one island, one resort is something that resounds very well generally with, um, uh, with, with the public. And we're, we're seeing that. A lot of people who might have gone to Europe in the summer, uh, Russians, Indians, um, et cetera, are booking and they're seeing how they can get in here. So funny enough, touch a bit of wood. Um, I'm always a bit of an optimist. This June might be the best June we've ever had. It's not a great month, so it's, it's not a huge deal, but in terms of revenues, not, not profitability, because of course costs have dropped, but um, in, in revenues. And I, th I think we're seeing July, August to be interesting as well. So in the short term, there's definitely a gravitation towards one island, one resort. But then there are two more aspects about ability, you know, the desire, in my opinion, is, is there. We're seeing inquiries that are stronger than they've been during the COVID phase. They're almost at pre-COVID levels. Some weekends are actually stronger. As touched upon earlier, it's more direct rather than through agents and tour operators because of what's happened um, with, with, with the travel trade. But uh, coming back to ability, the two aspects on ability. One is, you know, you have the desire, but then can you get on a plane? Is a plane flying? And it's a little bit chicken egg. And, I, and then the other is, the, the principal markets, those six key markets to the country that were touched upon earlier, is the government going to engage in bilateral agreements to create travel bridges or whatever the other phrase is? Um, so that's going to be very important, and that's uncertain. Um, you know, as, as we speak, uh, Britain now has a 14-day quarantine on returning into the country. It's the same with China. So when will that change? There was some good news um, that I read that uh, Britain's considering travel bridges at the beginning of July. Um, I would hope that the Maldives being a member of the common, Commonwealth and Boris having turned his back on Europe, at least wanting to, um, hopefully will embrace the Commonwealth and as, um, you know, as, as, as one of the poorer and smaller members of the Commonwealth uh, who's handled the virus very well. So uh, the performance of the government's been brilliant. Um, it wasn't like in some countries, you know, 30 days or 35 days before lockdown, it was six hours between the first case in Mali and the lockdown there. And it's naturally isolated. So most governments would say, well, the spread is well under control in, in the Maldives. They've got COVID under control. Fatality rate is one of the lowest in the world. You've got Singapore at 0.06%, Qatar at 0.05%, and the Maldives at 0.3%. So um, quite, quite dramatically low. Um, so, um, but it requires effort. It requires government to government effort. Um, the safe tourism guidelines have not come out yet. Um, our recommendation to the government is that they consult the six major countries um, and get their views on whether they're happy with the safe tourism guidelines because it's great to have safe tourism guidelines. It's great to reopen your borders. But if your principal markets like China, number one, India, number two, you know, UK, Germany, Russia, and Italy, if those principal markets aren't going to let their citizens travel to the to the Maldives without onerous conditions, that'll be a problem. So, and it's chicken and egg because until airlines see that there's a good relationship government to government, uh, they're not going to start the flight. So, um, right. yeah. In terms of a, a post-COVID luxury, how are you feeling it, um, regarding that? Um, yeah. change, changing uh, behavior post-COVID? Is sustainability the new luxury, health and wellness the new luxury? We just we just be interested in your views on on how you see that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sure. Um. I, I, clearly, um, sitting, uh, being in isolation for two months, uh, sustainability has gone up on the agenda. People have seen the benefits. Uh, this morning, I was snorkeling. I'm, I'm here at Suneva Fushi, and I've never seen such a big reef shark in our lagoon. It was like nearly two meters, swimming almost head to head. And in the past, they were very small. So the, the, the lack of activity has improved that. And I think in other countries, people have just seen, you know, we take blue skies for granted um, and the, the lack of smog that uh, people have benefited from that. So it's clearly something that people are talking about. There's clearly greater concern about health and wellness. Um, that's for sure. Uh, but they're, they're, they're sort of qualifiers, in my opinion. I, I think the differentiators which the Maldives has is um, because at the end of the day, people... Um, especially at the luxury end. You know, unfortunately, uh, people have good aspirations, but 
the wealthy people say, well, you know, I worked really hard this year. I didn't see my children so often because I was on business meetings and trips. And, you know, I deserved the money I earned. You know, I, I earned a lot. I'm very wealthy. But, I, I, you know, it's been a tough year and I deserve that holiday. So what's in it for me? And it'll just boil back to the experience again, you know, the beauty of the experience, how safe they feel now in a post-COVID env environment. And from that point of view, the Maldives is great because of this one island, one resort concept. The initial draft of the safe tourism guidelines had two criteria. One is a COVID-19 test a week before arrival. The other was one on arrival. They've taken that out of the second draft, the COVID test on arrival, but we will do it. So we've, we personally, at Suneva, we've given um, a donation to to the government, um, the availability of a testing machine on Marthro Airport and all our hosts. We bought test kits for, for that machine ourselves. We'll be operating it with the help of the ADK clinic. And um, all, all our employees will be tested on arrival two more times. Um, our guests will be tested on arrival and one more time. And wh why? Because it just increases the, the, uh, the safety. You know, they say there's an 80% success rate with one test. Obviously with three tests, it's higher and there's an incubation period of 14 days. So, so that's really um, what the luxury will be. It will be giving people a, a private island where they can start to engage with their friends. Of course, we'll follow the guidelines, tables being far apart and so on. Our hosts will uh, not wear masks in public areas. Uh, there'll be very thorough hygiene standards. But we also need to um, bear in mind the facts. And I think there is this element of, you know, as, as FDR said when he, in his inauguration speech, the greatest fear is fear itself. And I, I believe that the world has been overtaken by that. Because when we do study and analyze the facts, and I, I can see this, this has been a very fact-based webinar so far, um, I, you know, we've been speaking to various infectious disease experts um, over the last three weeks to understand three, three leaders in the UK, US, and um, three, you know, two in the US, uh, one in Singapore. And what they said was the fatality rate if you're under 50, uh, if you're under 50, the fatality rate is the same as that severe influenza we had in 2018, no greater. It's only if you're over, over 50 and slightly infirm. The other point we saw from the United Center for Biodefense, they explained that um, the half-life of a virus in normal conditions, like in an air-conditioned environment, like you have in Singapore, that's why it's spread in Singapore, is 18 hours on a surface, uh, where, the, where it's 25% humidity and 75 degrees. But when you get to 95% Fahrenheit and 80% humidity, um, the half-life goes to one hour. So from 18 hours down to one hour. If you have a bit of exposure of UV, you know, like the sun's coming in or you're in an open space, it's down to two minutes. When they contact traced 7,000 people who had been in contact with COVID positive people in the open air, not the inside, but in the open air, only one in 7,000 people were infected in the open air. So in the open air, in our environment, ch chance of infection anyway is low, and then we're going to create these COVID test traps. And so in a way, that will be a little bit of a luxury where they're in a bubble of um, hopefully health and protection. And then, all, of course, the sun and the food that generally we offer. And um, yeah. That sounds fantastic. If there are any lessons that we've learned in lockdown and, and, and because of COVID for the destination um, and for humanity in, in, in many ways, what would they be in your opinion? Right. Um, so I, I think um, we've changed our habits. You know, um, one of the big issues I find is that um, we have solutions today. So we could solve the global warming challenge today. Um, solar, for example, in most parts of the world, um, even colder climates is cheaper than the fossil fuel. So why are we building that capacity? Because we can't change our way. We're just so used to doing things the same way. And what COVID has done is it's broken that, 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 uh, normality. Um, so um, we, we hopefully um, have realized that we can change our ways. We've changed our ways in the way we, we work. And I suspect that um, travel will drop, at least corporate travel will drop. I, I, I suspect that people will be a bit more sensitive to the environment. People will avoid getting in a car or a train or taking a small flight um, and try and get the meeting done, um, you know, virtually. Um, I, I think we've, we've definitely embraced that. I mean, certainly in our organization, we're using Zoom more um, and uh, we're being able to co communicate sometimes better. Sometimes a virtual meeting is better than a, a physical meeting because if you've got more than seven, eight people around the table, um, it's easier when you're sharing a screen. But um, so I think those are some of the things, yeah. So has it, has it enhanced your philosophy at Suneva in any way? Yes, I mean, we, we've, um, 
we've our, our core purpose you know we've been quite clear on our core purpose and you know what, what was quite clear in this crisis is i mean uh, we knew that it would end you know we've gone through many crises um i've you know in that last 30 years and every crisis we've realized it's, it's ended um i've always you know i had cancer two years ago that was a bit of a personal crisis i was um i was um, um diagnosed with stage four uh, cancer um that was a crisis but it turned into an interesting opportunity because um uh, i i learned a lot about wellness about my body my health and um, i always realized that with crises you know if one looks at you know what are the opportunities to learn um one benefits from it so we we, we really felt that you know whilst we would be financially poor uh, poorer from this crisis uh, we would certainly maintain our values. We would not compromise our values, and we would um, leave this crisis hopefully personally, as individuals in our organisation and as an organisation personally um, enriched and um, uh, upholding our values more than ever. Thank you.